Hi, welcome to the Real Estate Roundtable, where we discuss all topics real estate. I'm Nick Aarons. Hey, and I'm Steve Crowley. I'm Darren Shepard. And I'm Jimmy Reed, and we're your hosts. to the Real Estate Roundtable podcast here with the Reed team. Uh, this is episode number four, and this is actually episode two of a three-part series on how to beat cash offers, because there's a lot of them out there. The market's bananas, uh, but we're going to get into a lot of very, very ba- valuable things that we're doing to help people beat out cash offers. Uh, I'm Nick Ahrens, and this is uh, Darren. I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Darren Shepard. So we got a, uh, Darren, I guess first things first, when going up against multiple cash offers and, you know, 30 to, gosh, I, I haven't seen over a hundred offers on properties, right? Is uh, preparing a buyer for battle and getting into that. Yeah. What are some yeah. of the things that you help people go through uh, when preparing them for this kind of market? Well, as I, as I'm listening to you go about this, the first thing comes to mind, and we should have a podcast on how do you make enough money to write cash offers, <laughs> and um, you know, <laughs> in this <laughs> in this market, right? Yeah. So, uh, so being on the um, most of us on the side of not writing cash offers and financing, um, there's in our first part series. So, if you guys can go back and and actually listen to the first part of this, we had Byron Watson with Neo Home Loans. Um, that really walked us through the uh, pre-approval process, the fully underwritten process, and everything that they do from a lending perspective to set a buyer up to succeed. And and even though they're getting a loan, to be able to look like on paper they can compete with a cash uh, cash offer. So make sure you guys listen to that first part series. But there's a lot of different things that we're doing. I mean, one of the things that we do is. We want to make sure they're locked hand in hand with a really strong lender um, that has taken them through best and worst case scenario um, that uh, we've so, all have. Go ahead. I was going to say, what, what do you mean best case, worst case scenario? Um, so best case, and we'll dig into this a little bit more. Um, best case would be, uh, obviously, you submit an offer at a particular price. You get the offer accepted open escrow, everything goes as planned, and you buy the home. Worst case, one of the things that could be is you um, have to pay a little bit more for the property, and you're competing with other buyers, and you're competing against cash buyers, and for some reason, the home does not appraise. That's a really big one that I know we'll get into today, so that would be your worst case scenario, and how do you plan if that actually happens, which takes the stress out of the transaction that we all know is a really stressful process and fun process of buying a home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the other things I know we're going to get into are, yeah, what to do with an appraisal, how to plan for that, as well as um, how to remove contingencies and still be protected as a buyer. Yeah. A lot of people say, I don't want to remove all my contingencies because then we're, we're exposed. We've, we've got, we don't have any leverage. And we can't back out. And if something goes south, we're going to be out whatever that 3% deposit is, call it 30 grand or 40 grand or 20,000, whatever that number is. Mm -hmm. So what is a step after that you take buyers through? What is a step? They're pre-approved. They're fully underwritten. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, what does that next step look like? Um, I will... It's interesting because I come back to exactly what came to your mind when we started, which is how can I tell this person to work enough to be able to submit a cash offer instead of going this route? (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, No, I just try to be as realistic as I can with people and be honest and tell them the truth and say, Hey, um, like for example, let me give you a situation I'm in right now. Okay. Um, A home was listed at 1.2 million. The last model match just sold at 1.3 million. Okay. Tons of offers on the table. My clients are only 10% down buyers mm-hmm. and they could go 15%, but I told them, Hey, the worst case scenario, that appraisal is going to come in at 1.3 million. Best case, it comes in at 1.45, which we got the home at. Mm-hmm. And we were competing against three different cash offers. And mm-hmm. we had to connect with our lender to say, Hey, kind of exactly what you said, Darren earlier, which is, mm-hmm. Mr. Lender, 
we all need to jump on a call here and go through, hey, if it appraises, yeah, we're good. Everything's great. But in that worst case of this home appraising $150,000 short, what do we do? How can we restructure this deal? What do payments look like? Can, can we save it and keep it together mm -hmm. if there's a $150,000 difference there? Because yep. normally what would happen is the buyer would go 10% down payment, appraisal comes back short, the 150, and the buyer has to front an additional $150,000 uh, most buyers think mm -hmm. and maybe even a really good a really high percentage of agents think specifically listing agents think and so when you submit that 10 percent down and you're you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars above the highest comp they immediately look at your offer and say okay um this is great and all but you're actually not going to be able to buy the home <laughs> so how do you how do you yeah. overcome that that that's what would go through my mind so how do you overcome that well there's a couple of different things. And this is why I completely agree with you having a great lender who can pick up the phone and help, you know, reanalyze the situation is absolutely key here. Uh, so the example we had is we could go 20% down, but we're likely going to be what's called an 80 10 10 loan, meaning 10% down payment. Um, and then we're going to get a loan for an additional 10% as a second home loan. And the first home loan will be 80% of the, uh, the price of the property. Got it. So it'll, it'll help mitigate the $150,000 out of pocket, as well as not jump the payments too, too, too much. Makes sense. Makes total sense. So when you go into that situation, you prepare the offer, you submit it. Do you have a process that you go through after submitting that offer to be able to articulate that information to someone who sells a lot of homes on the listing side mm -hmm. to maybe, Hey, this is the second home they've ever sold. Well, that's kind of a loaded question because when I'm dealing with a listing agent who knows what they're doing and has sold a lot of homes, it's pretty easy. When I'm dealing with an agent <laughs> who has no clue what they're doing, it's a totally different story. Yeah. A lot of, t a lot of times we have to actually say, Hey, can you jump on a call with my lender right now and have my lender walk you through this information? Because a lot of agents just don't do enough business to know that you can restructure a loan to be able to get this kind of thing done. Got it. Got it. And would you say most of your buyers that you work with are less than 20% down or is this a rare occurrence or is, is this more common? Uh, good question. So I would say it's pretty split equally into three groups I'm working with at the moment. Um, that 50% down buyer and higher, uh, people right on that border of barely getting to 20% down payment. And then a third group of buyers who are more in that 5 to 10% down payment. Got it. No, that, that makes total sense. Yeah. And then now, now that you've submitted the offer, you've uh, had your lender, you've had a group call with your client, um, yep. talking about best and worst case scenarios. Now you moved on to submitting the offer articulating the information to the agent um, and seeing if they're able to jump on a call with your lender that can convey that information to them on how that process mm -hmm. will work best and worst case. Yeah. Is there a step after that? Is it cross your fingers and go to sleep and wake up in the morning? Like, <laughs> is, there is there nothing else after that? Uh, in this market, uh, one of the good options is cry yourself to sleep because you've got <laughs> 72 offers you're competing against. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, what I like to do personally is I like to keep in touch with the agent. Um, and for example, the one, the example I just gave you, uh, the buyers are Scott and Lauren and the other agent, his name is Christian. So I said, Christian, we're going to submit the offer. Here's a deal. We've walked through it with my lender lender called him and, but Christian, I want to follow up with you in a few hours or tomorrow morning. Is that okay to see if we need to readjust and reposition our offer? Okay. What does that mean? Um, meaning at this one, we originally went over the last comp that was at 1.3 million. We went at 
Okay. And I said, Christian, I want to know where offers are at and dig into that. And I want to keep going to bat for my clients right before that deadline of when you guys are going to review. What I was able to find out was that there were offers in the mid 1.4 millions. We were about a hundred thousand dollars short. So I had to have a secondary group conversation with Scott Lauren and our lender to say, okay, what if there's a huge appraisal gap of that $150,000 or more? What does that look like? Uh, they were okay with that payment and the restructuring because of what our lender was able to do. Uh, and then we resubmitted way higher, just right before that cutoff. Got it. So just to unpack that or help me unpack that. Yeah. So you're still negotiating after you submit the offer, you're still pushing and pulling all the way until um, that seller selects that offer. So it's not hitting send, get all the front stuff we just talked about done, hit send, yeah. and then wake up, you know, a couple of days later, you're saying, hey, after we hit send, I'm still following up, having conversations. And then you got information that, hey, you guys would have lost if you would have stayed at that 135 and you made the adjustment. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm not uh, when I show up to the baseball game and we're up 12 zero at the end of the third third, I'm not going to leave and just hope for the best. Uh, we're going to keep playing all the way to the end of that ninth inning. Make sure we win that game start to finish. Got it. Oh, yeah. that makes that makes total sense. And then you talked about uh, handling appraisals or appraisal shortages. Mm -hmm. Is there anything other uh, situations or um, other ways you can make up an appraisal difference? Is that like common? Is it not common? I mean, that's probably a really big one right now. It is, it is fairly common. I'd say it's probably about half of the time right now in the current market, just with the way things are going. Um, so what I had the listing agent do is actually increase the price because he had this one listed at 1.2 million. I told him, Hey, can you increase the price to 1.4? To help the appraisal. I also had him print out the, uh, the other offers. Um, there was a cash offer 10 K higher than us, a cash offer 15 K lower than us and another offer that matched that offer. Mm -hmm. So I had him print out those, um, those purchase agreements and give them actually to the appraiser. So it's kind of pushing the ball in the appraiser's court to say, Hey, Mr. Appraiser, this is the market value of the home. If we've got four offers, all within a very small margin. Now it's your turn to figure out how to make it appraise. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, it sort of puts pressure back on them to spend more time helping, helping that appraised value come up. Yes. Yeah. That's are a really do, big are, one. Are you, are you doing anything like that? Yeah, we're doing the same thing. Um, we have one that's listed that we're on the listing side. And so in addition to the information that you just talked about, that we provide it to the appraiser. We also had the seller write an itemized list um, with the cost of all the updates that he's done in the home since he's been there. And so the appraiser can see the, uh, the extensive uh, repairs and upgrades and all the details and everything they've done to the property. And we provided uh, before photos so they can get a visual of you know, the impact that they've done to the property to, to, to make up that difference. So they could see yeah. that, Hey, this home wasn't just bought this way. Um, they put time, money, and effort into this. And also, Hey, by the way, if someone wanted to do it now, it would cost them a lot more to do these type of repairs and upgrades as it did in the past. And that's why the home is so valuable to the marketplace right now. Yeah. Got it. Hey, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, and it was something you noted earlier, which was, Hey, after Nick, after you submit the offer, are you still going to bat for your clients and continuing that negotiation process? Yep. Um, I know my experience, but I'm super curious to, from your experience, how many agents after submitting an offer, do you find follow up with you to try to keep that, keep that going? That's a great question. Um, I would say, about 50% follow up um, and follow up with me after they submit the offer. But the, the here's the big thing is that they don't yeah. ask the majority 
don't ask the right question when they do follow up. And well, so mm -hmm. go so ahead. I got, I got a question for you. But, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so it's following up and it's, it's stating, Hey, did you receive my offer? When is the seller making a decision? Hey, the sellers make a decision Tuesday. Okay, great. Keep me updated. Awesome. We'll do. So it's not, <laughs> it's not following up to get more information and position themselves. It's following up to see if we receive and when the seller's making a decision to convey that to their client, which they should. But there's also some nuggets there that they could grasp with the right question. So what are some of the wrong questions and wrong approaches that you've seen? Um, I wouldn't say there's a <laughs> right. I wouldn't say there's a right or wrong way um, yeah. to do it. But when you have the ability, especially in today's market, to get a listing agent on the phone, whether it's me, you, um, someone else that's out there and and has a great listing, when you get their attention, you want to try to squeeze as much as you can and much information out of that person in that time, because you might not get them back because they're getting you know times ten those calls and their clients reaching out to them. And then you have offers that they're sorting through. And uh, most people don't have the, the infrastructure and the systems that the read team has to be able to help out with all those calls and all the pressure. Um, and so they're dealing with it um, all themselves with their family and their friends and everything else they have going on. So it makes it challenging. Um, so I would just say there's really not a right or wrong answer, but there's just certain questions you want to ask if you do have the ability to get a decision maker or, or someone who can influence a decision maker potentially um, with that decision. Got it. What are, um, I'm curious, because there's always that one guy or gal, whenever I have a listing who calls and says, Nick, I know we're coming in low, but trust me, we're going to get the deal closed. I, so your seller doesn't need the extra $175,000. And I know we're the lowest offer, but just come on. Just just, just take my offer. Yeah, just does give that, me a cash. Does that actually work? Counter. No, yeah. it doesn't work. It's like, why <laughs> Why would I? And can you, can, can you convey this to your client. It's like, hey, if I have 10 people that you know are just at the dance and they just want to come hang out at the dance and I don't have to beg them, why would I call 10 other people and beg them to come to the dance when they're already there? So it's kind of the same thing with a, with an offer situation. If I already have five or six people that are willing to pay a certain price and they come in at that price initially, I'm not going to call the other five or six just to get them to where the other five people are at. Right. So they usually get left behind. And one of the reasons they get left behind is because um, their representative is not digging and following up with the right questions to see that they're actually, you know, going to get left behind. Got it. Can, just for everybody listening, can we kind of role play that for a minute? Like I'm a listing agent and you're a buyer agent. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let's say. So is this before or, or after? Uh, so you, you'll set the table. Go ahead yeah. and set the okay. table. Okay. 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 Um, Let's, let's do two parts real quick. One okay. is right before, and then one is the next day. So, so first one, homes listed at $900,000. Uh, you're calling me to see where things are at. You know, it's just packed with showings. And, and the way the market is, it's, you know, it's probably going to go nuts. Yep. So you pick up the call or you pick up the call. No, I pick up the call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Long day. So I pick up the call. Hi, this is Nick. Hey, hey, Nick, this is Darren with the Reed team. Hey, man, thanks for picking up my call. I know you're super busy right now and you're probably getting tons of phone calls. So thanks for taking my call. Um, I don't want to waste your time, Nick. So um, right now, are you guys above a million? Uh, you know, we're right around. I'm not supposed to say much, though. I, I, okay. I, can't, I can't say anything. Okay, cool. So you guys are just slightly above. Uh, above a million, right? Oh, so you're going to ask me twice. I'm going to ask you twice. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in that ballpark. Okay, awesome. And then so if it's up to you, um, just so I know how to position my client, are you guys going to be sending out a seller multiple counter if you receive offers? Or is there a possibility you could just uh, accept an offer? 
Uh, we might send multiple counters to the top two or three, but that's probably it. Um, I mean, if somebody blows everybody else out of the water, we might just take something and run with it. Got it. What would that look like? What would they need to do to blow someone out of the water? Great question, Mr. Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, no contingencies as is. Uh, go way over list, cash offer, quick close. That those kind of darn thing. Those get darn done. cash offers. Jeez, They're coming back. Cash offers. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so um, last question is, um, other than price, is there anything else important to your client other than price? Yeah, they'd like to stay in the home. They have not identified the next property yet. So if they could get 60 days to 90 days in the home after closing, that'd be great. Okay, cool. And then you're reviewing offers when? um as i come okay so as so there's no I'm set sending them date. over yeah there, there's no set date no, on. no no set date but we're not going to be taking any more offers after uh after sunday at nine o'clock all right wonderful man well we'll get something over to you um and i'll let you know once i have it in your inbox cool thanks bye all right bye <laughs> so so with that information um kind of three parts to it. One is I want to know where offers at. I, I've looked at comps already, right? So there's mm -hmm. one portion you're looking at comps and determining what you think analytically where you think the value is. And then there's a second yeah. part where you're looking at what does the market say the value is? What do the people say right now currently? Um, I forgot the third part. Um, so and what else is important market, outside of price? What's, there you go. And what else is important outside of price? And that's probably one of the biggest things that's missed a lot of the times is agents don't look at the seller's story enough. What's their story? What's their why? Why are they moving? Where are they going? Um, what are they freaked out about? And um, how can you create an offer and, and submit an offer to tailor to help out that stress? Yeah. One of the one of the questions I'll ask every agent is, do your sellers need a rent back? Yeah. Right? How long? Mm -hmm. What's and then I just asked somebody today in a negotiation, what's a realistic timeline? 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. I'll throw out a big number. Mm -hmm. So that agent goes, Whoa, Nick's Nick's clients might be able to allow 180 days. Yeah. That's gonna help us stand out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so outside of those things with structuring an offer though, cause you mm -hmm. were able to get a lot of info. Yeah. What are you doing to position your clients contingency wise? So a lot of people go, Darren, I don't want to waive all contingencies. That sounds really scary and terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, what, what are you doing there? But still being able to protect somebody. Yeah. So it's walking them through, and our lender actually does a really good job at, they know the contract, they study the contract, the people that we work with, we surround ourselves with, you know, rock stars on the lending side, on the agent side, on our vendor side. So everyone's, you know, does this full time is, is in the gear. So they understand how to protect them to a certain degree as well, right? And what we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things is letting them know, um, their outs in a contract and walking them through of, Hey, you have, you know, six, seven different outs on a contract and walking them through what that actually means and showing them why we are removing certain contingencies or we're recommending removing certain contingencies. And because of some of the homework and things we've done up front and why we're leaving one or two contingencies there to protect them just in case something doesn't check out. And how that's going to mm -hmm. convey to the seller when they're going through that decision making process. Obviously, you and I um, uh, represent, you know, a handful of different sellers. So it's good to be on both sides of the fences because you can understand what your sellers and the questions they're going to ask, which allows you to help your buyers prepare. And when they're submitting offers, you know, those things are going to pop up so you can just have it all nice and, and ready for that seller when you submit it. Yeah. Uh, to get a little more granular, what I'm seeing is, and I just had this conversation with a listing agent. Um, same one. I know I keep coming back to it with Scott and Lauren. Yeah. But um, 
I started picking apart the agent with the other offers and he says, oh yeah, everybody's got at least one contingency left for 10 days. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. seems to be removing everything except for one item that's got about a 10 day time span. And I'm, yep. I'm seeing that as a listing agent myself as well. Yep. Um, and I walked him through, I said, why do you think that is? He goes, I know exactly why that is because the appraisal is gonna come back before 10 days. So if the appraisal gap's too big, you have one or two outs because of those one or two contingencies. Mm -hmm. So Nick, what else can you do that's shorter than 10 days? So what we did is we rolled the dice a little bit. We knew the worst case scenario appraisal, they were still going to be able to restructure the loan based on those conversations to get it. But we actually went um, in, what do we do? We did six days on the inspection. And we did eight days on the loan contingency. Mm. So actually shorter than that 10 days to indicate to the seller, hey, we're not planning to bounce or get out of the contract if the appraisal comes in short. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really good. So you did you get that info? So you did you ask a question to get that information? Or did he just volunteer that information? Uh I started doing a little bit of digging mm -hmm. and just said, what do those top offers look like? Do you have anybody with literally zero contingencies? And he goes, yeah. no, everybody's got something in there. I said, does anybody have a 10 day full contingency removal? Yep. I said, yeah, just about everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. How can we beat that? Got it. And I just, I just flat out asked him, what would you like to see? And then he conveyed that to you, what you would like to see. And then you just put that together and were able to get that done and get it accepted. Exactly. But the key was going back to the clients and saying, hey, here's the risk. We might mm. not have that appraisal back in eight days. Worst case scenario, we have a notice to perform. And now we have two days to make it up. That puts us at day 10. Got it. And are you doing that just with your client? Or are you also communicating and going back and forth with the lender together and, and just, you know, looking at best and worst case scenario and how you can position yeah. them to, to succeed? Uh, with this one, I told the lender after we put it together, he wasn't very oh. happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I basically said, hey, um, so we got the deal, but here's your situation. Um, yeah. you're going to have to cancel everything you're doing right now and yeah. have your entire crew work on just my file. You're welcome. Yeah. And I, yeah. And that, and that was pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. He's, <laughs> it's like, I need you to, to run right now. Sorry. We got, we got, we got him the home, <laughs> but hey, here you go to, to get this done. But at yeah. the end of the day, it, it's all about the client and them getting what they want and how that's going to impact their family. I, I know, you know, you just bought a home yourself. And so how that's really not just the house itself uh, of buying a home, but how that really impacts relationships and friendships and people around you. And it's really cool to see that when clients get over that hump, um, some of the things they didn't know that the house would actually take care of for them and, and give to them um, yeah. when they find those things out, it's really cool to see. Yeah. So I, we never finished the, uh, the, that little role play. So, oh yeah. So, so you submitted the offer just over a million because you yep. were able to sort of get that information out of me. Yep. Now, now it's Sunday, six o'clock. We're only taking offers till nine p.m. Yep. What do you What are you doing? Um. So I'm usually calling back, depending on the depending on the relationship that I have with them. So I'm calling mm -hmm. them back and I'm saying I'm saying, hey Nick, so got the offer over. We're you know, and I'll remind them we're at a million fifty no loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, and we have a eight day, nine day, 10 day home inspection. How are we looking right now? Again, Nick, I don't wanna waste your time. Um, how are you looking right now? Uh, you know, I, I haven't gone through all the offers yet. Got it. When do you plan on going through them? Just so if we're not in the running, I could just kind of cut bait and, and move on. My clients really love the home, but again, I just don't wanna cause more paperwork for you and your team if we're completely way off, we'll adjust. But I just need to know if we're completely way off or if we're in the game. Uh, it's from, I, like I said, I haven't gone through everything. It's probably in the ballpark, but I, I just don't know yet. Got it. Okay. When will you know? 
roughly around then. And I'll just, I'll just give you a call back. I'm getting ready to jump into a meeting. So I'm doing that on purpose. I'm letting him know I'm also busy as well, getting ready to jump into a meeting, but um, I can give you a call back before then, before you go through the offers, just to see if I need to make an adjustment. Obviously it's going to benefit your client. I'll probably know in a couple hours. I'm, I'm just working on making a big old spreadsheet so I can send everything over to my clients. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know what I'll be doing. I might be busy. Might be on a, might be in an appointment with them. Got it. Okay. So you're um, based off what you've gotten right now. Are you yeah. sure you're going to counter or not? Cause if you're going to counter, then I'm, obviously I'm not going to bug you because you're just going to send a counter back. Uh, just not sure yet. Just not sure. Okay. All right. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what the sellers want to do, but I, I got to go, dude. I'm too busy. I've, I've got other people calling me and, and all kinds of offers I got to get to. Okay. Sounds good, man. I'll talk to you all right. soon. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. So why did you throw in the line, my buyers love the home? Buyers love the home. Because I, I want them to know that, you know, they're in it to win it. And, you know, that we definitely don't want to waste this client's time. And also, I don't want to waste my client's time. And we don't want to waste our time. If we're like completely getting smoked, what's the, you know, what's the reason to stay on standby on pins and needles for the next 48 hours if we're just getting demolished? So I'm trying to figure that out because there's a, mm -hmm. a emotional um, stamina in this process, right? So the least amount of emotional stamina we can all use and my clients can use to make this easier for them um, along this path, right? I actually had a conversation today with a VA buyer and he's like, Darren, you know, just tell me if we're, get, if we're gonna get smoked, like, just tell me and we won't even do it because, you know, we're getting excited and then, we don't want to get let down and then get excited again. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I'll definitely let you know when you're completely wasting your time and we have absolutely no shot. I'm getting the property. But we both know that if you have a really good offer, most agents are going to communicate with you. They're not yeah. going to leave, they're not going to leave you hanging to the side. If your if your offer is really good, they're they might be busy, but they'll they'll pick up that phone because you're, you know, or communicate with you or respond to an email you'll know that, hey, okay, I, I, I touched on something. I've hit something because they're engaging with me. Mm -hmm. Like that classic, um, <clears throat> if I were to pick up the phone in this, in this situation, be like, oh, hey, Darren, hey, uh, yeah, are you guys still in the game? What, what message would that convey to you? If we're still in the game? Like if I said, explain. like if you called me after you mm -hmm. submitted the offer, it's Sunday at 6 o'clock again. We're reviewing at 9 o'clock. Yep. And uh, I said, Oh, hey, Darren. Hey. Um, yeah. Hey, how's it going? How's everything? Yeah. Oh, I'd just be like, Oh, you have nothing going on right now. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't get you know you're in it. a good spot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's one of those things too, to where a, a lot of these deals are won and lost based on relationships. So I'll work with some clients and they're like, no, go back to them and, you know, completely shove it in their face. And I'm like, no, like, you can't do that. Especially here, most of us know each other or we know someone that knows the person we work with or, and, and a lot of it is one off of relationships and your name and your team and all that stuff is just as important to anything. So we definitely don't want to burn, burn bridges during this process. So, so you're telling me those agents who try and push and shove and be sharks, they, 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 they're going about it the wrong way. Oh, yes, man. <laughs> yeah. Every, everyone talks, everyone talks. I know, it's a, so true. Yeah. Everyone talks, man. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a small world in the business and, and you can, you know, you don't want to hurt your client or hurt your situation because you'll run across these people again. And it's even on the listing side for us of when we have multiple offers and we have people that are losing and they have absolutely no shot, we're gonna still play nice. You know, we're gonna be mm -hmm. you know, gracious to them and hey, sorry, it didn't work out. But if we have another one, we'll let you know, like we're gonna try to communicate best as we can. And because again, we might call them 10 minutes later and they have a, a listing that my client wants. And I was just a jerk to them. So what are they going to do back to me? So I'm going to always, um, you know, we call it play nice. Jimmy calls it play nice in the sandbox <laughs> with, with everyone um, yep. that we work with. It's super important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree there as well. Um, 
So what else are you doing to compete with cash offers? What else that I'm doing to compete with cash offers? So it's, it's offers, it's um, lending communication, um, mm -hmm. it's communication with your client, um, it's rolling the dice, but rolling the dice smart um, and knowing your ins and outs. Um, and it's just communication with that, uh, that listing agent. Those are the big, I would say the big three things that we really uh, hold a lot of weight on when we're submitting these offers and going up against these cash buyers. And then lastly, it's the love of the home, right? And what my clients obviously submitting cover letters nowadays is, is kind of phasing out um, due to a lot of different things, but um, conveying to them on, hey, they're in it to win it. I had a, uh, give you one last little role play, but yeah. I had uh, today, we're in negotiations and we, we, you know, we wrote a really strong offer and the agent sent a text and said, Hey, my client wants to know if your client is in it to win it. Like, are they fully committed? They're going to go with your offer. Are they fully committed? Luckily I had a screenshot. I had a text message from my client following up with me saying that this was her favorite home. This was her number one home um, out mm -hmm. of everything she saw. I screenshotted that and sent it to them and say, send this to your client. This is how committed the buyer is. They absolutely loved it. Luckily it worked out, but they want to know that someone is doing all this hard work and it's not going to be any funny business after they accept their offer because their family has a big, you know, now they're selling their home and putting their family on the line to make that move. So all those different things were, were juggling at one time per offer. Got it. So the stickiness of, <clears throat> of a buyer for a particular home is what you're really trying to hammer out as well. Yes. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's something I'll do as well. Haven't done that with the screenshot. That's, that's a good one. It just worked. I might, it I might, really just worked I, dude, I, I might have to start calling clients back. Hey, <laughs> here's exactly what I need you to text me know, word right? for word right now. Yeah. And it yeah. actually worked out because I put the date on there and it was like Sunday morning. So I screenshot it. It was like Sunday morning and it, it literally yeah. just worked out. But I was like, man, that's actually a really good idea. But um, obviously it would, the, the date and times would be like, man, that was three minutes ago, right after my test. <laughs> you know, what a coincidence. Yeah. It's like, yeah, so it just worked like, I, out that way. Yeah, I need you to send me this, but send it one sentence at a time. Yeah. So that, so that little timestamp goes out of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it worked out. Yeah, that's one of the things I'll convey a lot to listing agents is, hey, my buyers are going to close. This is the only offer we have out. We're not going to push back. It's going to be an easy deal for you and your sellers. Yep. You want to put an easy deal together with somebody who's way overqualified for the property. Let me know. We're ready to go. Got it. And I try to be as short as I can as well. Yeah. No, that's yeah. beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's that's good. And then And then we... Is there anything else that we didn't cover or something that we missed that is a sticking point of, you know, getting over the hurdle with a cash buyer? Is there anything else that you could think of missing? Yes, actually. Uh, and I'll ask this of listing agents. I'll say, hey, Darren, I, so you've got, do you have any cash offers? Great. Um, how much... Um, what was, what was the question I was getting at? Ah, here it is. It's back. It's back in the brain. Um, it's, I'll say, hey, is it investor clients or is it owner occupied? Mm. Are they buying it as an investment? Because we all know the investors will throw out tons of offers and after the inspection, just make a huge push for credits or concessions for repair work. Because yeah. they're not serious. They're just in it for the numbers. It's just math for them. Yeah. There's no emotional ties there. My yep. clients are going to close the deal. They're going to get it done. It's going to be easy for you. And um, I've already prepped them about the appraisal. I've prepped them about the home inspection. They know not to push back. Yeah. So there's a, a dip, I try to convey that message of there's an emotional attachment with my clients. Yeah. So they're going to get the deal done. Yeah. That's, imp that's really important. And especially if your clients are driving around the neighborhood and they're pointing things out, they're like, man, they talk to you know, Sandy and Michael across the street, and, you know, when they were at the property, it, they're just emotionally invested. And most, I, I, I don't know if it's me, but most sellers that holds a lot of weight on for them, right? Because they want to, 
leave, but they also want to put a good neighbor or a good person, a good family into that home for their friends and neighbors um, that have lived in that community that they probably are still connected with. So they, um, a lot of them want to go that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, What else have I missed? Is there anything, is there any, uh, anything else in the bag of tricks you've got that, that we haven't covered yet specifically for, for this, before we get into uh, our third segment? No, I think that's it. I mean, it's, it's, we went over the importance of just conveying information, getting information and continue to position yourself along that negotiation. No, I think we kind of nailed it. Cool. Well, Hey everybody, thank you so much for chiming in. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that third part here. Can't yeah, tell you guys too. exactly what it's about, but it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for doing this with me, Nick. Yep. Thanks, Darren. Bye. All right. Hey, thanks again for listening to the Real Estate Roundtable. If you'd like to connect with any of the sales partners here on the REIT team, our information is below and we'd love to chat with you.